Thank you, Rajul. I owe a deep thanks to you personally and your team, but also to IFPRI for getting me engaged on this topic. Uh, as you will, I mentioned to you a little later, this is something I've been working on, the top general topic of scaling up, I've been working on for a while. And there's really nothing more rewarding, I have to tell you, than being asked to pull together the expertise that we were able to tap around a topic that actually everybody got very excited about if they weren't already when we, they started. So it was a great experience, and I thank you. I thank Schengen for, for making it happen. Thank you very much. I'm also delighted to see Mirza and uh, Kevin here. I've always been a great admirer, I have to say, of the Aga Khan Developed Network, the Aga Khan Actions on the Ground. Uh, they've been great partners in my work in the past in, for the World Bank, more recently UN, UNDP. And I uh, would recommend all of you, if you have a chance, to engage with AKDN because they actually do a tremendous job. And it's particularly in the area of sticking with it and working with communities over the long haul for sustained and appropriate scale. I think AKDN uh, really uh, is an example to all of us. Then there's, uh, of course, Kevin and IFAD. I now had the pr privilege of working with IFAD on the Scaling Up issue for almost three years. And it was really Kevin who took me out of the more academic perspective and let me get into the kitchen of an organization that had stressed innovation and then moved on because they realized innovation is important, but it's not enough. And Kevin and the current president took a key role in the leadership uh, on this issue and asked us from Brookings to come and join them on this, uh, on this journey from innovation to and with scaling up, which they're now embarked on. And finally, let me thank all the authors, those who are here, but also those who are not here. It was fun working with all of you and a great experience. And your experience, indeed, is what matters. So I hope later on, if there are questions, I can call on some of you to help with answers. But let me jump right in. I don't want to give you a detailed account of what's in the briefs. And you will note there are no, uh, no uh, PowerPoint slides. I hope you appreciate that. Uh, but I don't know. It depends on one's prefer preferences. Uh, what I thought was giving you just a little bit of a sense of what's in the briefs, uh, hopefully t tempt you to actually go into them and read them. I have to say, I hadn't previously done something like this, putting together, what is it, 1,500 words. Uh, each brief was the upper limit. It's actually not that easy to write a brief that is meaningful, informative, and uh, substantive. But in the end, I have to tell you, I actually find it was a tremendous learning experience in terms of substance. There's a lot of substance in these briefs, so I do hope you will find some time to explore them. Now, let me jump right into the substance. Why do we worry about scaling up? Well, to some extent, Raju already has told us, we've got great development challenges out there, and you know, whether it's the unmet MDGs in many countries, uh, whether it's food security issues, agricultural productivity needs to be increased, nutrition needs to be improved, uh, rural poverty obviously needs to be addressed. Lots of challenges. Now, fortunately, in the last few years in the agricultural world, in the and nutrition areas, we've had more attention given to these issues. And that has resulted, among other things anyway, in more money, more, more investment, more aid, which is a good thing. Also in the context of the Paris Declaration, the Accra Agenda, and now the Busan Agenda, there is a commitment among the donors in particular and the partner countries to work more effectively together. It's sort of a top-down commitment. What my perspective on this is it's extremely important that we have these commitments, but they're not enough. We also need to work from the bottom up. We need to work on making sure that when there are successful projects, programs, interventions, that we don't stop. We don't just focus on making this project a success. We actually think from the beginning, what if this works? What then? And think from the beginning, what are the key factors, the key drivers, the key enabling uh, uh, conditions or spaces, as we call it, have to be created to ensure that if this project, if this model, if this innovation works, that somebody, not necessarily the agency that uh, supported the innovation, but somebody picks it up, has an interest, has a capacity to move forward with it. Because otherwise, you'll end up with pilots to nowhere. And I, my own uh, experience in the past, in my, as a development 
uh, expert and manager, but also now that I work with other development agencies, too many of the initiatives we undertake are pilots to nowhere. So I think we need to systematically find ways to move beyond this. Now just a moment to give you a bit, bit of background. Myself and colleagues in Brookings and beyond have been working on this issue of scaling up now for quite a few years. Uh, we started uh, actually prodded by Jim Wolfenson when he was at the World Bank. He picked up on this issue. Some of you may remember after he left the World Bank, he uh, endowed a, a, a small center at Brookings that focused specifically on these, this issue and I had the privilege to work with him on this uh, particular issue. So we did some review of experience and then started working with organizations, including IFAD, uh, with UNDP, with OSAID, with JICA, with GIZ, with the World Bank, to basically see whether we could get these institutions to begin to focus systematically on the question of scaling up. And I'm happy to say, and we actually have uh, uh, Kevin here, and he'll say something about how he sees this in a minute, that there is progress being made. And so I see this particular exercise that we now have, uh, uh, th that you see the, the product of, actually as a further step to reach out and to get this idea of scaling up more broadly rep represented. And I was particularly pleased that when we invited agencies like Oxfam, AKDN, um, the Gates Foundation so on, each of them picked up, we had not one rejection when we requested, could you contribute a th something from your own experience? We had not one rejection, all of them came in, and so I'm actually quite confident that this idea <clears throat> is picking up. I understand the new president, of, incoming president of the World Bank, Jim uh, Kim, Dr. Jim Kim, is actually also interested in this topic of, from his health experience, of how do we, how do you, what's the science of delivery of service and how do you scale up uh, for impact. Now, what we uh, presented you here and what is in these, these briefs is, first of all, a number of experiences uh, with scaling up projects and programs. But beyond that, we also addressed some cross-cutting themes, such as community-driven development, value chains, institutional challenges, uh, vertical funds, and uh, fragile states. Does scaling up also work in, and should we focus on scaling up in fragile states? Uh, we uh, looked at the experience of various institutions. So we had AKDN, Gates, Oxfam, IFAD, the World Bank, PepsiCo, and the new initiative in nutrition, the Sun Scaling Up Nutrition Initiative that uh, contributed uh, their experience. So you get a cross-cutting, not just cases, but you also get institutional perspectives, and you get uh, cross-cutting issues in, in this summary, in this uh, um, uh, collection of essays. Now let me just... Uh, bring this introduction to closure with a few highlights that I believe are worth taking away uh, from the, the, the briefs. And you will find in the last brief where I tried to pull the lessons and the insights together a bit more systematically, so I'll quickly run down a few of those. And I'm using, in doing so, I'm using a simple framework that we in the team that's been working at Brookings on this issue over the last few years has found to be useful. And I think uh, uh, IFAD has found it also be useful and others, maybe not systematically, but are beginning to use it because it's a way of organizing your thinking about scaling up. So let me run down a few aspects of this particular framework. We start with actors. So who are the actors that actually uh, tend to be involved in successful experiences with scaling up? And we found that actually it's not usually just one actor, not just one institution, not just one individual for sure, not just one team. It's usually teams, it's usually groups involving many different actors, domestic, international, local, uh, and, and, uh, and at, at higher levels uh, also of, uh, of government or jurisdiction. In the end, what matters is successful multi-stakeholder coalitions and alliances. They are critical. If you want to scale up, you better find a way to create these multi partnerships with other actors because it's only if you look towards the partnership uh, and the multi-stakeholder alliances that you're likely to be successful. The second area that we tend to look at is uh, the dimensions of scaling up. So what do we, do we want to just replicate a successful, say, area development program in one particular area, replicate in another area, or go to another beneficiary group, uh, what we call horizontal scaling up, or do we also need to actually do the vertical scaling up, which would involve getting into the regulatory framework, policy reform, institution building, at a national level, perhaps, at a regional level, or at least at a sector level. 
And what we found, at least what my interpretation of the experience is that we collected here, is that actually when you're interested in the, what I call horizontal scaling up, the replication of good success, very quickly you will find you need to get into the vertical dimension. In other words, you will have to very quickly look at the regulatory, possible regulatory impediments, policies, institutions, and so on. The third element of the approach we take, and that is reflected in, in the issues that we address in the summary, is you want to look for pathways. In other words, you take a particular intervention, a particular project, and you ask yourself, well, if this works, what might be a pathway to actually scaling up? So you ask yourself, what is the ultimate scale that might be useful to address a particular problem? And what might be ways of getting there if this particular intervention is, is successful? Now, what you find is that there are no blueprints. There are no fixed pathways. First of all, you, over time, you always have to adapt as you learn uh, what works and what doesn't work and what are the factors that uh, create success. Some are more spontaneous, opportunistic. Others are more deliberate and sort of with a long-term deliberate uh, way forward. But in all cases of successful scaling up, I would submit, there has been a systematic readiness and a vision that you need to go beyond the one-time intervention. Uh, you need to be focused. You need to be selective. That's, by the way, a lesson that the Gates Foundation reflects very nicely in its uh, briefs. And you need to have this long-term perspective on the pathway of scaling up that you might uh, envisage uh, pursuing. The fourth uh, element of a scaling up agenda or approach would be to think about you know, what drives this, this scaling up process forward. Who are the drivers? Who are the leaders, the champions? Who has the vision that we, if we want to be supporting this process, would have to link up with? Uh, in AKDN, it's pretty clear uh, His Highness uh, Aga Khan is one who clearly has that vision and drives his institution forward. In IFAD, it's also pretty clear, current president and his uh, right hand on the operations side. Kevin, it's very clear. In other organizations, one may have to look more carefully, or it's actually, and we found the case of Peru Highland Development, the drivers were actually groups of people. They weren't necessarily just one person. So uh, clearly, leadership, vision are critical drivers. In cases where communities are engaged, it's actually often the community demand. If something works, the communities want more, and other communities want more. So the driver can be and should be, if, to, if one is properly structuring it, can be and should be community demand. Incentives, you have to think about what are the incentives to actually drive something forward. A land ownership, in the case of many agricultural interventions, is a key incentive that you need to give people rights to land so they actually feel an incentive to invest and to better themselves. Internal institutional incentives, what makes a country program manager and IFAD think about not just the one project, but think about that scaling up. What are the incentives that Kevin needs to give his managers? Or for that matter, Aga Khan give his, uh, his colleagues. So maybe you can say a bit more about that when you talk later. And finally is what we call spaces that need to be created to let things grow, uh, remove obstacles, or as Rajul put it very nicely, actually I have to remember that enabling conditions, of course, we, it's a good term. So what are the spaces that need to be created so that things can actually grow? Well, institutional space. You need to have a good understanding, good analysis of what are the institutions that might not just do the innovation, but <clears throat> if the innovation works, might actually be the transmitting mechanism. Who, what are the institutions that could at scale sustain an effort if it's successful? And of course, you need to have capacity building that actually is focused on creating the institutional conditions to move from project to program to scale along your pathway. So my, actually my conclusion for capacity building, which we're all to some extent interested in into, is it shouldn't be disconnected from pathways. It should be focused wherever possible on specific needs of specific scaling up pathways. Policy space, we really talked about the uh, need to create incentives, the regulatory and uh, legal framework, whether it's land ownership, and there are two interesting cases in the, the, in the uh, briefs, uh, Lus Plantation, uh, the Lus Plateau uh, example in China, where land ownership was particularly important and the regreening experience in Africa. Or rural, think about rural credit. If you don't have the right policy and legal framework in place, you're likely to have problems. Market space, 
for uh, in particular for value chain initiatives as uh, Schengen reminded me we didn't stress it enough in my summary in our summary you need to be sure you understand what is the market conditions in which you try to scale up productive production productivity if a market is inflexible you may end up just depressing prices and wages and that's really not the goal that you have so you need to think about the market space fiscal financial space Fiscal and financial resources are usually extremely limited in the countries we work in. Relying blindly, if you wish, on budgetary support over the long haul for scaling up is often not the, uh, the option. So what do you need to do? You need to focus on cost reduction, cost containment, and on cost recovery. And that's, uh, there are some examples in the, in the briefs. Partnership space. We already talked about the need for partnership. And so you need to start mobilizing early in a project's or initiatives life, you need to think early and mobilize potential partners early, engage them early, because if you come late, they'll say, well, it's all your baby. I'm not interested. I've got my own fish to fry. So you need to bring them in early, and you need to think who are the right partners that if this thing works, we could hand off to or work with to scale it up. And you need to plan for phase out and handover as an aid agency in particular. And Oxfam, actually, the Oxfam example is a very nice one in this context. Finally, and absolutely critical is the le learning space. There's, in this business, and it's, it's per perfectly obvious if you think about it, it's absolutely critical that you assemble the evidence about whether something works and what are the conditions that will make it possible to scale up, the conditions that you need to put in place. So you need to have the evidence on these aspects of your, of your program, of your scaling up process, and so monitoring evaluation tailored to the scaling up process is, is essential. So that's sort of the key findings, and I'm running out of time, but let me just say one final word about the role of donors. When I've been talking about scaling up, I, people often ask me, well, it's not really about aid agencies. It's really about, of course, the stakeholders in the countries that need to think and get into the mode of scaling up. And I, I would agree, it's absolutely right. That's where the real action is. But aid donors, external assistance, development assistance, can help or hinder, it can support or undermine the local efforts of scaling up. And my own assessment is that too often, A donors who are fragmented, who are focused on one-off interventions, projects, who are focused just on getting the project done, and making sure the project doesn't fail, uh, but just let's get this project done right, that they actually often more of a problem and more of a hindrance and need to change their own mindset. They need to think and act long term beyond the project, see the project as a stepping stone. They need to focus much more on partnerships, cooperation among the partners from the bottom up, supported by Paris Declaration and so on, but you really need to do it at the bottom. And you need to, and this is critical, as a manager and a leader of an institution, you need to review your internal policies, the processes and incentives as IFAD has done, and we've put out a paper that actually reflects this analysis for specifically for IFAD. What does IFAD in this case need to do to create the internal incentives, the policies, to actually make IFAD supportive of scaling up rather than get in the way? It's not rocket science. It's actually important to keep the simple and unbureaucratic. But I think it's what's needed is the change in mindset. And so thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to hearing from Kevin and Mirza how they're doing it. Thank you.